Welcome to Up Close, where we go into the pack with some of the top names in poker. Tonight, Parg Parkinson. When was the first time you went to Las Vegas with a plan to win money? Um, the year Dan Hamilton won the World Series. Whatever year that was. 1996, I think. I don't know. You should probably ask Dan. He, he, probably, <laughs> he probably remembers. But I went over with Scott Gray, and we'd been broke for a little while. And uh, we borrowed some money from Barry Mann. If he just gave us a couple of hundred quid. And I think I turned the 200 into 600, and Scott turned it into 1500, and I turned it into 500. <laughs> and eventually we got about 10,000 together, and we decided to go off to the, to the World Series. This was it, right? This was every penny I mean, we had in the world. We took a lot with us. Why did the partnership even start? <coughs> well, we were hanging out together a lot in those days, and we were uh, we spent a lot of time talking poker together. So we we kind of decided maybe in the February of that year that um, if either of us got any money, we were going to go to Vegas for the for the big one. Did you reckon you were a good tournament player back then? Um, it was very hard, you know. I mean, like you never really know what level you're at. Like when I went to play in the Eccentric Club, I mean, I, I, I was completely starstruck by all these people I'd read about in the newspapers. I mean, it took it took a few months before I realized that um, that there wasn't that big a gap. And I suppose going to Vegas, I was like, people told me I was in with a good chance there, but I wasn't sure. I mean, you see all these guys. I mean, you know, we'd read this book, Tom, Tom, not Tom Michael, what would he call the guy? Amarillo Slim had written like when we were in college. This guy wrote a poker book, which was a load of crap. <laughs> it was, and we read it like 10 times each. <laughs> it, was, it was like this was the big time. So I suppose we were a little bit intimidated turning up. Well, I was. Uh, Scott Gray had been there a lot before, so he kind of knew that we weren't as far behind as we were supposed to be. What happened at, for, at 96? Did you guys win money? Oh, yeah, we won a lot of money. How? Well, it we started off with um, the game plan was Scott started off playing the pot limit hold'em. And he, he didn't tell me what the game plan was. I think the game <laughs> plan was he was supposed to play tight in the bottom and hold him, and then I was supposed to take the profits and play the Oma and the tournament. But Scott hadn't told me that the plan was a little more dangerous and that this 10,000 we brought over there mightn't be coming home. <laughs> so I kind of spent a couple of days watching Scott playing the bottom and hold him, but it, it scared the shit out of me. Jesus, he would represent three or four <laughs> different hands in the one pot. Like, <laughs> somehow or other, the guy would throw his hand away in the exit. <laughs> I went to the room and started watching the basketball. <laughs> it was way easier. But Scott got going pretty, pretty, um, pretty well at that. And then it started, um, there was only one Omaha game. That was like 10, 25. But you know, Sammy Farhar, all of these guys were in it. So we graduated from the Hold'em up to the, the Omaha. And you'd been playing Omaha in Dublin? I mean, yeah, it wasn't a big Omaha. game back then in America, was it? No, but it was, um, we were kind of lucky. It wasn't a big game in America, but the, obviously because we played so much in Europe, we got fairly good at it. But the Americans assumed that the Europeans were um, absolute mugs no matter what they were playing. So we, we got to play a lot of Omaha against uh, American Hold'em players. So we kind of had a slight advantage. But they kept playing us. I mean, they, they were playing Hold'em in the Omaha. And they, I mean, they, they knew we weren't, we weren't as good of players as they were. They couldn't understand that uh, maybe we understood the game a little more than they did. So I mean, it was great fun. And you I didn't get into the, the main event that year? No. Um, I played the Omaha tournament. God, that was, that, that was such excitement. You know, the, it's a bit like, you know, when you're a kid and you're playing soccer and all that and you dream about playing in a cup final or representing your country. I mean, uh, it was just, you know, you, you get to go and play one of those events in the World Series. It's like, uh, that's such a privilege. It's like you're living the dream. And we've thought about it, like, for years. In there, stuck in the middle of the Omaha tournament, playing the best guys in the world. You know, we had a real um, romantic view of the whole thing. And then that guy, Ronnie, what do you call him? You know the guy that sells the phone cards? No. No, he broke me hard. He knocked me out four or five <laughs> tables. Out. Ron, Pete, <laughs> no. Ron, um, oh, I don't know, I hate the guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very nice fella, but every time I look at him, that's the guy that knocked me out. But that's how big the World Series is. And right? that was even a minor event. Yeah. Well, it was a minor event to you. I mean, it was a big event to me. <laughs> I'd, I'd put 20 years of my life getting ready for this. All right, so 19, 1999. You weren't actually in the main event. Uh, you didn't even know you were going to play. No, I had no intention <coughs> of playing. What happened was, uh, the night before the big one, we'd been ahead on the trip, and the night before the big one, uh, Scott won. won a, well, he didn't actually win a satellite, but he, he got $7,000 out of a satellite. And Scott came up to the room, and he said, great, you're in. You know, we were ahead on the trip. We, yeah. were, uh, we had enough to stick me in the big one and still have a profit. So Scott was all excited. 
So I just told me, just don't be ridiculous. There's absolutely no way I'm going to go down and play the big one in the state I'm in. Like I was, I was a nervous wreck. I mean, I'd been smoking cigarettes for years, and I was, I just couldn't concentrate for longer than half an hour. So uh, Scott was a bit disappointed because he wanted. Like, like everybody thinks I'm the nutcase in the team, but uh, I'm actually the voice of reason. It's Scott's the nutcase. No, nobody knows that. He wanted to put all the tank in. To oh, the yeah, oh yeah, oh well, yeah. He always wanted to do that. <laughs> I'm always the guy that says, no, well, maybe, um, <laughs> maybe we should hold back a little bit. And everybody says to Scott, how do you, how do you operate with that nutcase? It's kind of funny. But um, George Kiefer and a pal of his were, were there. George was going to play the big one. But uh, George asked me if I'd be interested in playing with their money. But uh, I said, no, not really. That I, If I wouldn't do it with our money, I didn't really want to do it with theirs. And I explained to George I'd given up cigarettes and I wasn't yeah. really interested in um in playing, but uh, that I didn't think I could hold it together for four days. But George said, well, we'll take a chance. <laughs> so that's what happened. I ended up, like George's uh, daughter had been taken off to hospital in the middle of the night because she got dehydration or something. So like, it, I think the World Series was supposed to start at 12 o'clock and I got a phone call from George a quarter to one. So you better get down here, you're in. <laughs> so it was kind of weird. George borrowed the money from me to pay my entry to take me to the World Series. <laughs> What happened that first day? It was your first day. How did you feel, first of all, sitting down for the first How did time? I feel? <laughs> Jesus, man, this is the... If you don't enjoy this, you're dead. You know, I just bounced into the room. It's, uh, if you've never played the big one, you just don't understand. Like, it's, it's Wembley, it's, it's Augusta, it's, it's Wimbledon, it's whatever. Like, I mean, just to think that you're, you're, you were born lucky enough to get in there to take just one shot, like, at the, at the, you know, the world championship. I told you, I'm a romantic at heart. I loved it. <laughs> but I got real lucky because I, I got drawn in between um, Ali and the Devilfish. So uh, that kind of took away any nerves I had about it because uh, I was having a bit of a laugh with the two guys. So we, you know, because we were three Europeans together, we kind of uh, kept talking all day. or Sorry, kept listening. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the day went really well. I think I finished the day with 24,000. Well, was it a five-day event back then or a four-day event? or uh, Four. And it seemed like about three or four hours. It's just, it's just like watching all your life you know, running right in front of you. When did you start having a feeling that uh, you were really going to get down there? You, what happened when it got close to the money, first of all? I mean, you guys needed the money, didn't you? Um, well, we didn't. We didn't. I mean, we, wasn't, we weren't all in here or anything close to it. What happened when we got, <laughs> what happened when we got near the money was I started playing like a lunatic. Because I had worked out it was, wasn't much point in getting to the money without getting any serious money. So I've, uh, we were kind of all over the place uh, just before the prize money. <coughs> and then something really weird happened. Uh, like, uh, I think after two days you're in the prize money. I, I came back on the third day. And you know the way you, if you're in a poker tournament, you, you kind of expect that once people get into the money, there's that big, there's a big, <sighs> like everybody exhales, yeah. says great. And then people start getting knocked out all over the place. But the third day I went down to play, and I was kind of expecting there'd be a lot of action in the first hour or two, and it was only, I think there was only four tables left or something. But everybody at my table just froze. I was getting ready to freeze as well, and I thought, <laughs> well, if everybody else is going to freeze, well, maybe I should go and help myself. I, got, I started off the day with 60-something with, uh, thousand, and I had a million after two or three hours. I, got, I won every hand for 35 minutes. <laughs> And I, I try to win every hand all day. And <laughs> <laughs> it was just, you know, sometimes in your life, uh, you know, you're sitting at a poker table and just something takes over. It was like, it was a combination of a lot of things, like adrenaline. Maybe I've been dreaming about it for a long time, so I was prepared to push it to the edge. Uh, I picked up a couple of hands. Nobody else, the, the key to the whole thing was nobody else was picking up anything. So it just... I just started battering all over the place, and they got out of the way. Well, when you started getting down there, I mean, it was it was there was no mugs there. It was a very tough final table. I think Eric Seidel was there, a young Huck Seed in form, of course, Noel Furlong. What, what, what was the setup? The setup was great. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, we just launched George McKeever went out seventh. I mean, the whole thing had been we were kind of lucky because there were so many Irish. I think six Irish guys started playing, and we finished first, third, and seventh. But because we were stuck in this kind of pressure called them, but every time you looked around, you'd see a, an Irish face there laughing. And uh, the, the other two definitely didn't need the money. So uh, I forgot, any, I forgot <laughs> I needed the money and just got tied up in the tournament. It was, it was exciting stuff. George went out seven, but there was still um, Noel and I obviously made the final table. 
like playing against uh, you know such a great player as Seidel, that probably that, that that probably helped us a lot because everybody expected that um, that Seidel and Hoxseed would uh, would battle through the the cannon fodder and they'd end up playing you know the big heads up for the championship of the world and that this would be the biggest thing ever happened in poker, but, um, and we were just kind of invited along to <laughs> the bit players in the event, but so I don't Furlong didn't go anywhere <laughs> to be a bit player. So the 1999 World Series final table with Huck Seed, Eric Seidel. It, you said the final table, what was the seat draw? Well, the, the seat draw was from the, from the day before when there was uh, nine of us left and we had to play down to six. It was like uh, Seidel was in seat one, I was in seat two, and um, Huck Seed was in seat three, and Furlong had got the, the perfect draw. He was in seat four. I mean, he was always going to get to the last table as the chip leader because uh, <laughs> it was just a joke. I mean, uh, Everybody, everybody was trying to steal anything they could get their hands on, and the four of us all had a lot of chips at the time. I kind of felt sorry for Seidel because I mean he was he was <laughs> he was three guys behind him, and everybody was trying to steal everything. I mean Seidel had raised, I'd come over the tops, hooks he did call, and Furlong would be all in. And just, <laughs> so uh, that, that was, was kind of my four thieves. <laughs> well, I figured that that was maybe my biggest achievement in poker that I got to the final table with chips because I'd, I'd had. Um, Huxley and 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 um, Furlong on, on, on my left. And he was at the top of his game right at that point, Huxley, right? I mean, he's never been the same after losing that pot, has he? No, no, none of us has. <laughs> <laughs> but so when we got to the final table, and you know, there was a little bit of history there. I mean, Huxley was I kind of Seidel, you know, Seidel is Seidel. I mean, I, I honestly think Seidel is the best player in the world. I mean, and he's certainly the best ambassador um, for the game as a player. Like Seidel just sat there, and he he was. Um, like he knew what was going on. Obviously, he knew if he'd been sitting to the left, he'd have been doing the team and so. But he kind of half enjoyed it in a way. But but Hook Seed was getting really, really uh, annoyed, which which just surprised us. I mean, this guy already had a already had a bracelet. But a guy'd raise, he'd call, and then Furlong would raise, and it turned it had turned out that in the end, maybe Hook Seed had the best hand of the three of us. Yeah. So by the time we got to the final table, like a lot of the damage was done. Um, Seidel had a. Uh, he got a terrible time of it from a, what do you call the guy that finished second? Alan Gehring. Oh, yeah. He broke Seidel's heart. I mean, uh, Seidel ended up having to play with him because he couldn't play with the other three because we had <laughs> position on him. So he was kind of trying to pick off Goring and Goring keep calling with rubbish and plop and missile pair. And it would go like, check. And bet from Seidel, call from Goring, and check, 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 check. Pair of sevens, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and that kept happening.